Good evening and welcome. Uh, it is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana, 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UCIMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or UPTV, as we like to say on the televised version of this show. These views are our own, and by our in this instance, I mean myself, because once again, it's just me uh, talking to you. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so there you go. So I finally made it through the intro. Uh, thank you very much for your patience on that. Um, I would like to kind of take up where I left off last time, talking about uh, morals and ethics <laughs> a bit as they relate to immigration policy, because I really think this is an important point and one that is um, increasingly discarded in favor of practical and uh, other points of view. Uh, I, I say other because a lot of the arguments that are are being made are becoming increasingly uh, untethered to what I guess I would say shared reality and more focused on and and pointed towards um, a minority shared reality, if that makes sense. Uh, but what I mean by shared reality is like all of us um, – you know, the sun is in the sky, the, the earth is beneath us. You know, there are points that we all share. <clears throat> and um, I would say generally, nationally, within this country, there is a is a, a sort of a view that is the majority view, which is uh, people should be generally good to each other. We should treat each other well. Um more or less respectfully, <laughs> depending on who you are and who you're talking about. I mean, there are some people, there are a lot of people who will say, well, you don't have to treat, you know, those people respectfully because they're rude. You know, rude people you don't have to be respectful to or whatever. You know, there are a lot of variables involved. But generally speaking, assuming everything starts at a, at a zero as opposed to some sort of preconception being involved, you know, uh, people should be respectful. People should be uh, care for one another. Uh, we should help whenever possible. Uh, things like that, you know. There's there's a kind of a general sense of ethics or morality that I think is shared around the country. So uh, where immigration seems to fall out of that. is that it's being marketed so negatively and has been for a long time by different groups for different reasons. Um, for example, big business, um, corporate business, they generally are fond of having a workforce available to them that they can uh, mistreat, I guess, for lack of a better word. They can underpay and, and uh, you know, these people won't complain. They'll come to work, they'll do the job anyway. So uh, big mis business kind of likes having an underclass that they can uh, take advantage of as far as the workforce goes. So uh, they tend to paint immigrants in a negative light because they don't want the country to just embrace immigrants and say, hey, welcome, we will afford you all the same rights and privileges that we citizens enjoy. That doesn't work out very well for uh, businesses that want to hire employees at sub-minimum wage and or without uh, benefits and things like that. So there is a kind of a contingency there that is not anti-immigrant. They like the fact that immigrants are here, but they don't want you 
embracing them and and elevating them to uh, the same status as citizens. Then you have like nativists, racists, um, etc., xenophobes, however you want to describe it, who they don't like immigrants for all sorts of reasons, uh, mainly because they tend to be other in some way. And the record of this goes back to the beginning of the country, um, pretty much. Like each successive wave of immigrants that came here after the the one before it is generally been treated, mistreated in some way and, and marginalized. You know, at one time it was the Irish or the Catholics or the Jews. You know, it, it's something. They're, they're not right. The Eastern Europeans, there's something wrong with them. Uh, Chinese. Uh, and now it's uh, people from Central and South America. Um, it's happened over and over again. It's, it's not surprising, but it happens time and again. And in each sense, it's an anti-immigrant because it's an anti-other. So there, in other words, there are an, uh, more than one group that is painting immigration as a, a negative thing. Um, and so when I say that arguments being made tend to generally revolve around practicality, it's because the majority of people in this country, whether they're uh, ambivalent about immigrants or kind of not so sure about them, or even in some cases somewhat against them, there there is a need for them to define the people involved away from being entirely human or, or to take the subject and move it away from what should people do for other people and turn it into what should we be doing about this thing that affects us. So it, it becomes depersonalized primarily because it is inconvenient for people to face it as a personal issue. Um, so that's where the, the you know, well, let's talk about the financial benefits of immigration. Let's talk about all the money, all the work that they do for us, all the this, all the that, the benefits we get from them. That plays into the depersonalization of it. Um, and then so when I say that some of the arguments are increasingly becoming untethered from that shared reality is those that's where you get the xenophobes and the racists and the people who basically they they have they have to find a reason to be against it there's the stated reason is going to be generally different from the real reason because the real reason is racism or xenophobia. Uh, uh, we have, as a society, done a good enough job of making people think and understand that racism is a negative thing so that people generally don't want to admit to being racist. So that's where you have to get into these unhinged and sort of um, untethered from reality uh, arguments because they allow you to just make things up, basically. Um, so this is where you get the, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing disease, uh, they're bringing crime, all that kind of stuff that you hear. That's the result of, of just what's something bad. Okay, this is a bad thing. Let's connect this to immigrants without any cause or, or maybe some marginal cause because, let's face it, immigrants are people. People are guilty generally, across the board, all people, all races, all religions, all everything, people are guilty of being greedy or selfish or acquisitive or dishonest or whatever. So you can't, one can find without having to work too hard examples of immigrants somewhere who fit enough of these profiles that they can then say, immigrants are bringing crime because there are some criminals, criminal Im immigrants, um, ignoring the fact that immigrants, <laughs> citizens, are committing crimes 
in greater numbers than immigrants tend to, uh, well, that's, you know, we can't argue that point. So that's where that stuff comes up. Anyway, the point being that I want to bring the discussion of morality and ethics back into the discussion of immigration because immigrants are people. The real question, the, the real question that exists, that is being faced, is what do we do about the people in need who would like to come here and, and seek our help or seek an opportunity that they see here that they don't see somewhere else? What, how do we react to that? Um, and that, I think, is a moral question. Primarily, that should be first and foremost, the consideration is, all right, we're human beings, they are human beings, they have reasons to come here. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> they have compelling reasons that they're coming here. Uh, we have the ability to help them by simply letting them come here. We don't have to do anything beyond that. There is no thing that is required of us, the citizens of the United States, to do for the immigrants who want to come here beyond simply letting them come here in most cases. Then they're on their own. They sink or swim. They succeed or fail on their own ability, merits, whatever. Uh, opportunities, maybe there aren't any. Guess what? They'll probably turn around and go home if they don't find opportunities. If if you just did nothing, let these people come, they settle next door to you, they look for a job, oops, no jobs, uh, can't afford this house, and nothing's really working out for me, I'm going to try somewhere else. Then they go away. Problem solved, if indeed there is a problem. So, you know, we create the problem by acting like there's something that we ought to be doing. We really have to respond to this. We have to do something about this. So we create the problem, and then we create the necessity of solving the problem. And then we argue about what solutions will work, blah, 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 and we end up with the situations that we have now. So um, that's why I think we need to start with a moral or ethical question, what is the moral, what is the right thing to do for people who are coming here? And I think that kind of answers itself, but, you know, who knows? Um, and, and then proceed from there, because there are practical issues involved as well. If, like, if everybody were coming through one spot in the border, for example, let's say we decided to open the borders, everybody started coming through one spot, that would create a problem. That's a logistical problem. There are not that many places to stay on the other side. There are not that much food, you know. There's, uh, the highways aren't big enough, whatever the situation is. You know, then you would need to say, well, we have to spread this out a little bit. We have to funnel people in different directions so they're not all going to the same place. Everybody wants to come to Champaign. Okay, that's not going to work. So some people can go to Urbana. Some people can go to Rantoul. Some people can go to Effingham, you know. There are, you know, solutions available for all of these potential problems. But the biggest problem that remains is us. It is in our perception of what's going on and why we should care about it. And that's why I'm pushing for a show about ethics and or morals. So I'm going to read something again that I read the last show low these many weeks ago, and it is about morals. It's what morals are. So it, it is the following. Morals are the prevailing standards of behavior that enable people to live cooperatively in groups. Morals refer to what society sanction as right and acceptable. Most people to, tend to act morally and follow societal guidelines. Morality often requires that people sacrifice their own short-term interests for the benefit of society. People or entities that are indifferent to right and wrong are considered amoral, while those who do evil acts are considered immoral. 
While some moral principles seem to transcend time and culture, such as fairness, generally speaking, morality is not fixed. Morality describes the particular values of a specific group at a specific point in time. Historically, morality has been closely connected to religious traditions, but today its significance is equally important to the secular world. For example, businesses and government agencies have codes of ethics that employees are expected to follow. Some philosophers make a distinction between morals and ethics, but many people use the terms morals and ethics interchangeably when talking about personal beliefs, actions, or principles. For example, it's common to say, my morals prevent me from cheating. It is also common to use ethics in this sentence instead. So morals are the principles that guide individual conduct within society. And while morals may change over time, they remain the standards of behavior that we use to judge right and wrong. Now, I'm making a, a big deal about this because if you examine your morals, and, you know, obviously when one is on the radio, one is speaking, just broadcasting in all directions rather randomly. I could be speaking to anyone right now. But I think it is fair to say that if the average person examines their morals and thinks about how they are supposed to treat others, they will agree that the way our country is treating immigrants these days is immoral. I think that I can say I think I can say that without any fear of contradiction of any serious contradiction. I'm sure someone out there is going to argue with me. Fine, go ahead. You're welcome to it. But I I think that we can safely say that the way our country is treating immigrants these days is generally and mostly immoral. It is, in many cases, amoral, as in indifferent to right and wrong. Uh, many of our immigration laws are amoral, but the way the current administration is treating immigrants is immoral. And so that behooves us to ask ourselves, well, what do we do about that? And I think it is very important to do something. Vote, obviously. Vote. Uh, make your beliefs heard. Speak up when the situation um, makes that a <laughs> possibility. And, and conduct yourself in a way that is you can be comfortable with, morally speaking. Excuse me. Sorry, the minute I get in here, my voice just goes. Um, it is, it's, it's kind of almost um, out of fashion, maybe, to talk about morals in this way. Um, I think... Probably and mostly because religious entities have have co-opted the concept to the point that um, they truly believe, and a, a lot of religious people truly believe, that they own morals, they own morality, and that their system of morality is the only system, the right system, the one ordained by God, or whatever it is, or however you want to look at it, uh, they believe that so fully that they don't believe in the possibility of a moral system not based on some sort of religious background. But I think it is pretty clear that you can easily have a system of morals and standards that has no relation to religion. It may match up at certain points. Religious, uh, you know, Imperatives may match logical imperatives, but uh, generally speaking, morals belong to everyone, and morals are a necessary part of living together as society. 
we have to have a shared sense of what is acceptable and not acceptable, right and wrong. It doesn't have to get down to absolute specifics uh, and details. Those are arguable points, but it has to be a general sense of things. Uh, for example, at one time, it was considered absolutely moral imperative to get revenge against someone that you felt had wronged you. So dueling, for example, was a, a moral act because you have insulted me or you have demeaned me in some way. Uh, it is my responsibility, my honor rests on teaching you a lesson or whatever that thing is. And nowadays we see that as, as not a good thing. That would be immoral now, <laughs> but back in the day, it was moral. So, I mean, morals change, and I'm not saying that we can necessarily come up with, or nor should we try to come up with something that will be all completely true for all time, for all people in all situations. But for us right now, we need to decide on something like that. So, you know, it's not like you and I can sit here and decide the morals and ethics of, of uh, today and then somehow enforce them on, on society as a whole. But it is important for us to try to discover them in our own lives and act accordingly. So <clears throat> with that in mind, I wanted to read this first article because I thought it was very well written. And it goes to, of course, <clears throat> one of my favorite punching bags, Donald T., our current uh, temporary, <laughs> hopefully very temporary president, and it's entitled Trump's Recessional. And it was written, actually, by a former Republican speechwriter, um, one of Bush's speechwriters. I don't know. He, he, he did a lot of stuff. Not, so it's, it's interesting to see his take on this. So um, he writes... In the days when I helped people with speeches, our relationship often began like this. Can you help me with this speech? Sure. What do you want to say? Awkward pause. It's amazing how often there was not an answer to the question. The speaker would often have very clear ideas about the image he wanted to project, but no urgent message to communicate. He wanted to fill air for 10 or 12 minutes or longer, and at the end of which people would regard him as compassionate or strong or whatever other image he had in mind. But how to get from here to there? Well, that's why he was paying me. I was jolted back to those days as I reread President Trump's 4th of July speech the day after it was delivered. Trump's speech was written by people who did not know what they wanted to say. It was a litany of old glories, a shout-out to heroes carefully balanced by race and sex, but with no conscious theme or message. It narrated old triumphs in war and commerce, but without apparent purpose or direction. First this, then that, now a third thing. Trump wanted pictures and video of his big day. Trump standing in the place where Martin Luther King once stood, the podium swathed in flags and bunting, bordered by tanks, adoring audience in front, screeching fighter jets overhead. Strong, proud, the speech existed only to provide a reason why he needed to stand in one place long enough for five waves of warplanes to cross the sky. Yet it's a strange thing about words. Talk long enough and sooner or later you will say something. Consciously or not, Trump did say things that evening. As Trump retold the story of the Pacific War, he said this, quote, Nobody could beat us. Nobody could come close, end quote. When he paid tribute to the Air Force, he said this, Quote, as President Roosevelt said, the Nazis built a forest fortress around Europe, but forgot to put a roof on it, so we crushed them all from the air. He added, no enemy has attacked our people without being met by a roar of thunder and the awesome might of those who bid farewell to earth and soar into the wild blue yonder. End quote. Bringing the story to more recent times, quote, the army brought America's righteous fury down to Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and cleared the bloodthirsty killers from their caves, end quote. Were these wars right or just? Why were they fought? What were their outcomes? 
Except for the mention of freedoms, sprinkled randomly throughout the text, those questions went unconsidered. Instead, Trump would periodically ad-lib, what a great country, after this or that mention of power and violence. America is great because it crushes all before it. Altering for circumstances, it was a speech that could have been given by Kaiser Wilhelm or Napoleon or Julius Caesar or the Assyrian Emperor, Emperor Sennacherib. A great country is one that is feared by its enemies that can inflict more devastating destruction than any other. How did the United States get so strong and fearsome? Trump revealed some assumptions about that, too. He said of America's warriors, quote, They guard our birthright with vigilance and fierce devotion to the flag and to our great country. Now we must go forward as a nation with that same unity of purpose. As long as we stay true to our cause, as long as we remember our great history, as long as we never ever stop fighting for a better future, then there will be nothing that America cannot do. End quote. Devotion, unity, history, fighting. But not democracy, justice, individuality, peace. From time to time, one of Trump's more devout speechwriters will try to insert references to God into the president's mouth. Those references never sound natural from the least spiritual president in the nation's history. They were fascinatingly all but absent from this speech commemorating the independence of a nation, in the apt phrase of G.K. Chesterton, with the soul of a church. Instead, there was only vainglorious boasting, see our wealth, see our power, see our glorious triumphs over the mounded corpses of our enemies. We will always win because we will always fight. It was as if the whole ceremony fulfilled Rudyard Kipling's foreboding of how empires end. Quote, if, drunk with sight of power, we lose wild tongues that have not thee in awe. That was how the American president spoke on his on this 243rd commemoration of a nation that began its independence with a solemn acknowledgement of a decent respect to the opinions of mankind. No non-American could watch that spectacle at the Lincoln Memorial and feel that America stood for anything good or right or universal. Power worshipped power for its own sake. Quote, We will always be the people who defeated a tyrant, crossed a continent, harnessed science, took to the skies, and soared into the heavens because we will never forget that we are Americans and the future belongs to us. End quote. That sentence of self-congratulation toward the end of Trump's speech was probably lodged in the clipboard memory of some 1980s vintage word processor hauled from the executive office building. It's bumpf. A thousand times typed, a thousand times said, and yet this July 4th, after all the rodomate that preceded it, I found myself paying attention to those hackneyed words in a way I never had before. Will Americans always be that people? Are Americans that people now? For heathen heart that puts her trust in reeking tube and iron shard, all valiant dust that builds on dust, and guarding calls thee not to guard. For frantic boast and foolish word, thy mercy on thy people, Lord. That's the end of that arc.